All right. Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am going to go ahead and record this lesson portion. And so uh, there's a slight chance that your, your video could be on this recording. And if you'd prefer, and you're on Zoom, not to do that, you can go ahead and just turn off your camera. We'd love to see your handsome face, but I uh, wanted to, to let you know that. So today is September 11th, as Jim said, and we have been back in school now um, almost exactly a month. We went back on August the 14th uh, with students face to face. And so it is, um, you know, it, it's a challenging and it's an interesting time, but <clears throat> the good news is God, is God is good, God is here, and God is in control, and we are not. And so this morning, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I am going to share with you a, a little bit of, of where our Sunday school class is going this year. Um, in July and, and this last month, I had a chance to share a little bit from last year's Sunday school lessons. We are in the midst of a class called um, Curiosity and Questions, Jesus and Science. And we had two different books last year that we, we looked at. Uh, one was, uh, is called The Language of God, and it's uh, written by the man who is a medical doctor and a scientist and led the Human Genome Project and really talks a lot about DNA and, um, the, and fundamentally the compatibility that he finds between his, his, his life as a professional doctor and scientist and a follower and disciple of Jesus Christ. The other book that we, we looked at um, was by uh, also a medical doctor, uh, Richard Swenson. And uh, Swenson, I got to know back when we lived in Lubbock um, and, and he uh, had written a book called um, Margin, Restoring Balance to Overloaded Lives. Uh, just a fantastic book. And um, the, the text that we, looked at for the class is called More Than Meets the Eye, Fascinating Glimpses of God's Power and Design, and similar to um, The Language of God uh, by Francis Collins, he talks about compatibility between faith and, and, and a perspective of science. And so this year, as I was looking at different sources and thinking about, you know, what kind of a book might inform our, our, our reading of scripture and thinking about, um, these ideas, I was drawn to this man named John C. Lennox, and I found him through a project that started in Harvard, I think in 92, in the early 90s, called, um, um, gosh, I've turned 50, guys, so my brain doesn't work as well as it used to, um, uh, uh, and I don't have this written on my slide, so it'll come to me, but it's, it's, a, it's a project that brings together uh, people of faith along with um, just the, the academic community, um, and yes, I will get that name, and I will say it late. I will remember it later. Anyway, this is how I found him, was on their project, um, their project page, and because they've got a lot of speakers that come and talk, and so John Lennox is a well-known author and, and, and an apologist, we would say, as CS, in the spirit of C.S. Lewis, for Christianity and explaining the message of Jesus, and so uh, his latest book that was just published this year uh, has a very, you know, small sounding title. It, it's called 2084, um, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. And it's not a technical book. It's a, a book written for lay people. Um, he is an Oxford mathematician. But anyway, I thought I would just kind of give you guys a little bit of a taste of some of the things that we've been talking about. And we've, we've been meeting now for a couple weeks and we had homework, optional homework in our class, and that was to watch a special that I want to commend to you all from PBS. It was on PBS Frontline in November of last year, November of 2019, and it's called In the Age of AI, or Artificial Intelligence. And so I want to give you a little bit of a taste here, and I want to... Um, I want to begin with some Bible verses, and I'm going to read several different ones, but we'll start with uh, Psalm 34, and I'll be reading all these from, from the message today. So uh, how many of you guys remember the Jetsons? Anybody? Anybody a Jetson fan? All right. You, you remember uh, their, their little robot, Rosie, you know, who took care of everything, and 
There's George Jetson on the right, you know, sending uh, Elroy, I think is his name, off to. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Astro the dog, you know. Um, I, I bet Andy Fuga could even sing the song if, if we would want to. But, um, you know, I'm really pretty fascinated by our visions of the future. Um, I've mentioned perhaps before that my wife is, is a real big Star Trek fan. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Star Wars guy. So, you know, we've, we've informed each other during our marriage about different characters and histories. But the, the vision that a lot of people have today of the future, um, and not just the future, but today, uh, can be fairly grim and, and not nearly as optimistic and positive as what we, we might think of if we're watching the Jetsons. And so one of the questions that we're tackling in our, in our Sunday school class, and I want to invite you guys to, to wrestle with as well, is how, how does Jesus call us to live in our technological age? We are right now uh, beneficiaries, obviously, of, of technology. I'm sitting here in my fifth and sixth grade classroom at Cassidy School here in the village. You guys are, are up in Edmond. We've got folks uh, not only here in the Oklahoma City area, we've got brothers in Florida, in Alabama, you know, we're, we're all over the place. We're connected. Um, how does Jesus call us to live? Because there are a lot of positives to this technological world, but there's also some, some real negatives. And so I don't know how many of you have been watching images of the wildfires in California and in Washington, Oregon, uh, one of my good friends lives in Bozeman, Montana, where they've, I guess, had a bit of a respite because of some rain. I was hearing about Colorado fires. You know, it is, it's pretty crazy uh, when you turn on the news and you see what is happening there. There are literally large segments, sections of, of, of our world and, and towns and cities that, that are burning and that are facing uh, devastation. This is a picture of my grandmother on the right, uh, Trudy Henley. This is my mom's mother who was born in, um, well, let's see, my mom was born in Shreveport. She was, I guess I'll have to ask my mom. She, she grew up in, in Louisiana, um, but I got to stay with her when she was living in Lubbock, Texas. My mom grew up in Abilene. And I, ha I have on here a couple things. I don't know how many of you guys remember Art Bell Coast to Coast. But, but my grandmother listened to him on AM radio, I think it was AM, like every night. And she watched CNN all day long. And I know that you guys will remember the Y2K era <laughs> when there was a lot of fear about, you know, is, uh, is, is civilized society as we know it gonna, gonna grind to a screeching halt because, you know, computer programmers hadn't at the time Steve Shelton aside, because I know that Steve, in fact, Steve probably could tell us stories about being involved in taking steps to, to, to curtail a catastrophe. But anyway, when 1999 became 2000, you know, there was all this talk about, you know, is the world going to end and, and what's going to happen and, and are we going to have this catastrophe? And Art Bell was, was a big guy talking all about conspiracies and UFOs and all kinds of things. And my grandmother would get pretty fired up and she would also just turn on the news and she'd see fires and hurricanes and storms and, you know, and, and crime, and she could, she could get pretty fired up. So here's, here's my good news today. Um, even though we can turn on the news on whatever screen we have, or we could actually, you know, read a newspaper, those, those do still exist. Um, even though there's all this change, even though there's all this apparent chaos, God is the same. God has been, he, God is, God will be, you know, God is beyond time. God does not, you know, have a, a, a mortal clock the same way that we do. And so I want to share uh, four verses. And I don't know, maybe we'll end up doing this in two parts because we've got about 15 minutes. I think, I think we might do that um, if Lee's amenable to that, just because uh, we start, we, you know, we, we had a little, a little pause and Anyway, I think I'd rather do that. So let me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read these four verses, and then I, I'm going to give us some table talk time. That might be it for today. But as 
my wife and I this week were watching this documentary again. I've, I've seen it, you know, uh, it's two hours long. This is the PBS Frontline special. I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff about, you know, disruption of jobs, uh, trucking, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk next week, but, you know, trucking is the number one most common job in the state of Oklahoma. And there's pretty good reason to believe that in the, in the really near distant horizon, we're talking five to 10 years, we're going to see significant disruptions in that career field and others because of the continued march of automation and artificial intelligence and robotics and these kinds of things. And so these are four things that I definitely believe we hear through scripture that they don't change, okay? That God calls us not to, to be fearful, that God calls us to see each other, just hearing the names of our brothers and speaking their names out loud and lifting them up in prayer this morning is, is powerful. It's important. We're called to love each other and we're called to care for each other. So we'll take on this big question, not only today, but, but I think we'll just, we'll go ahead and just do this next week as well. Um, how are we, this is what I want you to think about. How are we called to live differently? How are you, how am I called to live differently than other people because we follow Jesus. When I was in the Air Force, we learned this term, FUD, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There's something called the fog and friction of war. You know, you have all this stuff that happens and, and you need to maintain a cool head and you need to be able to do the right thing even amidst chaos. I don't think that's just true of military members. I think that's true of everybody. You know, we make better decisions if we're not wound up and emotional, if we can try to have a clear head. So what are we to do? Um, and, and I do believe we're called not to live in the same way that everyone, not everyone, but the way that the world and the, and the broad culture calls us to live. So here are a few verses, and I'm going to read from the, the message and I, I love sometimes to juxtapose or put these against each other with the NIV or even the King James. But I'm going to go ahead and read from the message. This is Psalm 34, the first seven verses. I bless God every chance I get. My lungs expand with his praise. I live and breathe God. If things aren't going well, hear this and be happy. Join me in spreading the news. Together, let's get the word out. God met me more than halfway. He freed me from my anxious fears. Look at him. Give him your warmest smile. Never hide your feelings from him. When I was desperate, I called out, and God got me out of a tight spot. God's angel sets up a circle of protection around us when we pray. So that's Psalm 34. And you know, all of these verses, I think, are great. I, I personally really love being able to pull up verses on my phone, and I like that I can flip in between them. So one of the things you might consider doing this weekend or in the week to come is taking some of these verses and, and reading them to yourself in different versions uh, because God speaks. And one of the things that he clearly tells us over and over again, Jesus said it time and time again, is not to be afraid, you know, not to fear. Jesus never said, it's a really scary world out there, guys, and, you know, let, let's all be scared together. He never said that. He said quite the opposite. So another thing that, that God says clearly in his word is that we need to see each other. And this verse, along with, you know, many of our, many of our prayers, not all of them this morning, you know, talk about us as the body of believers, as the, as the church, the First Presbyterian Church of Edmond. Um, but we're called to see other people as well, others in our communities. And, I'm, and I feel personally challenged to think about, you know, how can I not only see but reach out to people in our community who, who are suffering, who are walking down a different road that, than I am. The stories today about Dale and and where he's at and, and the importance of coming to see him and to talk with him, you know, hugely important. So this is from Luke. This is uh, the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And these are going to be verses 14 through 21, again, from the message. Jesus returned to Galilee powerful in the spirit. 
News that he was back spread through the countryside. He taught in their meeting places to everyone's acclaim and pleasure. He came to Nazareth where he had been reared. As he always did on the Sabbath, he went to the meeting place. When he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and the battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. Jesus didn't just come for the wealthy or for the, the, the politically powerful. In fact, he came and spent most of his time serving some of those who had less standing than anyone else in the society of their time. And so even though we've got all these ways to insulate ourselves from the struggles of the world and to, to kind of just sort of shroud ourselves in, in comfort in a cocoon, you know, I firmly believe that Jesus calls us to not just be retreating into our, 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 um, our cocoons. And we're called to see what's happening in the world and to act. And that doesn't mean in this time of COVID, each one of us is, is supposed to be going out of our house. You know, my parents up in Manhattan, Kansas, haven't really left their house much since March. And I'm glad their retirement community has had some positive cases, but those have been in, in their main building. They have a dementia and, and Alzheimer's unit. I mean, they've been insulated and protected from it. So, so please don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying let's all go charge out and pretend like there's not a global pandemic. There is, but we are called to see beyond our immediate surroundings and, and to see the, the plight and the, and the struggles of others. Um, and, and we have no idea what other people are walking through. Just because you see somebody look like they've got it together, look like, you know, they've got to take a shower recently and they got a meal recently. I mean, it doesn't mean they've got it all together. And so um, these, the ways in which we're able to reach out, um, you know, we can utilize technology to do that, but we can also just pray that God's going to open our eyes to see what, where, who are we supposed to see today? Who are you supposed to see? Who am I supposed to see? Okay, third of all, loving each other. This is from 1 Peter, starting with the, uh, 1 Peter 4, starting with the seventh verse, 7 through 11. Everything in the world is about to be wrapped up, so take nothing for granted. Stay wide awake in prayer. Most of all, love each other as if your life depended on it. Love makes up for practically anything. Be quick to give a meal to the hungry, a bed to the homeless, cheerfully. Be generous with the different things God gave you, passing them around so all get in on it. If words, let it be God's words. If help, let it be God's hearty help. That way God's bright presence will be evident in everything through Jesus, and he'll get the credit as the one mighty in everything, encores to the end of time, oh yes. And I'm going to read one more verse, and then I'm going to give you guys, we'll, we'll give everyone five minutes to talk at their tables about these verses and about these ideas. And this last section is from Galatians, okay, Galatians 6, written by Paul, and this is the verses 7 through 10. And what this is focusing on is how we're to care for each other. This is what Paul wrote. Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants, he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. All he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life, eternal life. So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. And so 
Brothers, I believe we are doing that work today as we connect and as we lift each other up in prayer, as we consider the ways that we need to be praying for each other um, and, 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 and acting um, in, in different ways to, to support each other. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and put us in breakout rooms. So we've got, it's, it's about five minutes till the top of the hour. So I'm going to give us five minutes to talk. And then at the top of the hour, I'm going to close us out with, uh, with a quick prayer. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and I'm going to stop the recording.